Leslie McCallum, thank you so much for joining us for this LTH product briefing. It's my pleasure to have Leslie here. Leslie is the founder of Lexada and comes to us live from Toronto, Canada. Um, Leslie, what is your background and how did you come to be a legal tech founder? Sure. My background is as a practicing lawyer specializing in securities law, both U.S. and Canadian securities law. I practiced for about 15 years um, on capital markets transactions and then later in my career focusing on legal research. And what, what caused you to move away from legal practice and, and found a legal tech company? Yeah, in the latter part of my um, career, I, on the side, was developing a strong interest in natural language processing just because it was all over the news and I started learning more and more about it and becoming very curious about the relationship between the technical tools for natural language processing and complex legal rules that I was dealing with in my working life um, with securities laws. And I, I started to wonder about how this computing um, could be brought to bear on technical rules to make securities law practice uh, more efficient. Can you tell us a bit about the problem that Lexada was designed to solve? Sure. In, in my practice with securities law and kind of both stages of my career, doing deals and then becoming a researcher, um, I found that people really disliked looking up legal rules. Um, the rules are very technical and it's tricky to find um, the answer because there's a long legalese and then an exception, exception to an exception. And I thought that this could be made much more smooth with the modern computing tools. And I wanted to allow people to have a more Google-like experience where they could ask their question and very quickly get a response that made sense to them that wasn't overly technical. And when you say non-experts, who are your target buyers or users of this tool? My target is both um, people that work in public companies that are concerned with securities compliance of the company who um, have to worry about these rules, but may not have 10 years of securities law experience before becoming in-house counsel. Also, um, for those in law firms that do practice securities law, um, many of them, um, may, some of them might be experts, but not necessarily enjoy spending a lot of time on legal research, and their clients don't necessarily want to pay for them to spend a lot of time on legal research. And so making their work much faster that's terrific. I love this sort of broad applicability. Um, and for everyone listening, one of the things that is quite fascinating and of the moment with Lexada is the fact that it is built on GPT. Um, but we can discuss that a little bit as we watch the demo. So Leslie, can we jump in and see Lexada in action? Sure. I'll give you a, a, a quick demo. Here is Lexada's homepage. I'm going to log in first, uh, just so you know, if you click try now, there are some sample questions that you can ask um, without having to log in. But what I'll do is log in so that we can ask some custom questions. So for the demo today, I'll focus on US securities laws. That's where um, Lexata is currently really building the size of the database. Under US securities laws, I have so far these topics um, that you can ask questions about. And if you want to browse the rules that are within these topics, you can click and you can get the actual rule, just like any other research tool or just like going to the SEC's website, um, word for word, the rules are on the site. But the real value add and what's unique about Lexata is the ability to ask questions and obtain uh, written answers. So I'll do a sample question. Uh, this is a topic that is on people's minds. It's about climate disclosure. Um, the SEC has proposed rules outstanding about what pub public companies have to say about their climate efforts. 
And these rules have been getting a lot of comments and people are wondering when they're gonna become final. And so I've put the proposed rules uh, into Lexata's database. And one controversial item, especially is scope three. So this is a question that I've been getting on the site uh, quite a bit. Um, companies have to disclose their scope three emissions. So people can just ask a, a regular question effectively. Yep, they can put it in plain language. Um, and even if it's a statement or a shorter question, the system will treat it like a question. Um, you, can also, you can ask extremely detailed questions or more general. I'll show, I'll show you a more general question after this one. So this is an answer generated by um, Lexata's natural language processing pipeline, which relies on GPT-3. And, and Leslie, can mm -hmm. I just ask, wh where is it drawing this information from? So it's, it's a combination of two things. It is Lexata's own database that we have built that is specially organized and designed to be high quality input for generating answers. So that's the substance of where it's getting. And then the capability in terms of being able to write a proper full sentence answer in the English language and, and to compare the question and determine what the sentences should be, that comes from the training of the large language model from OpenAI GPT-3. And so the reason people can rely on these answers is because you, a lawyer with 15 years specialized experience in securities law, have put together the extremely good information architecture behind the scenes with accurate information. Is that fair to say? That's a very important part of it. Um, it's, it's, you know, way, way back to the general principle, garbage in, garbage out, a big part of Lexata's workflow is the database that it starts with and the quality of that. And that's partly why on the homepage, you saw seven topics in US securities law and we continue to build topic by topic. So um, I'll just, you can look at the answer. Um, it says, yes. <laughs> uh, so companies do have to disclose scope three. You can also ask what is scope three if you, if you, know, if you don't know, um, but it notes that they have to be disclosed if they're material. So now a company, they've got a succinct answer but what they might say, mm -mm, I don't know if I'm going to trust this. I want to, I need to read these rules myself. So underneath the answer are the rules themselves that are applicable to the question and from which the answer was written. And so, Leslie, yeah. um, presumably you could also ask, what does material mean in yes. relation to scope three emissions? Yes. Um, okay. In relation to the, to this type of question, if a lawyer went and did their own research on the rules, the difference, I suppose, is first of all, they wouldn't get this nice response, which actually summarizes the position in relation to the specific question. And secondly, they wouldn't be taken to the precise section of the rules. They would have to read through in order to find the exact relevant area of the rules. Is that correct? That's correct. One of the things that makes um, securities laws so complex is that you have many different regulations. And for people practicing in this area, learning all the rules and where to find them and what types of topics are within what rule is can be very difficult. So let's see, um, let's see another question quickly. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so I'll do a question that's a little bit more general because uh, that one was was fairly specific. Um, a lot of people, uh, risk factors is a big topic in terms of uh, providing proper disclosure by public companies. They have to explain the risks of their business. So um, let's say someone just wants to get up to speed on um, the SEC's risk factor rules. So 
this is a general, it's not even put in question format, it's a statement, but it the system treats it like a question um, and gives a general answer that you have to disclose material risks um, and they have to be in a separate part of the document with a heading risk factors underneath them. And, and you can then read the more specific rules below. If you ask a more general question, the answer tends to be more, more general and then you can zero in. One final question, um, because people will be wondering about this. Um, how is this different from, for example, if someone did go to something like chat GPT and ask the same, the same questions about security law? If you put in something general like SEC risk factor rules, you may get a, a quite a similar answer because of the broad language model training that GPT has had on information on the internet. But where Lexata is different is that it's narrowing that down through the use of the database of the laws to more specifically cover the subject matter and to ensure that the answers are accurate. The internet contains both right and wrong answers. Lexata's goal is to provide correct answers that can be relied on by lawyers. So it is really containing on chat GPT to focus on this subject matter and, and to focus on providing accurate answers. Chat GPT does not provide reliable sources. If it did provide a source, the sources it might provide might be an article that someone wrote right. in a publication. That might be fine. But, but you don't know if you can rely on it. It's really yeah. interesting, Leslie, because I think you've addressed two questions people have about chat GPT, one of which is, um, how reliable is it and can you use it off the shelf to do legal work and what are the legal use cases? You've shown how you can take chat GPT or GPT, sorry, and use the technology, but add value by providing really deep information about the law. Um, and then the second thing is explainability, the impossibility for something like a, a large language model to really explain where it's got its information. And you've added that in to Lexada, which is such a critical thing for lawyers. So I can really see the huge value here. Um, and thank you so much for coming on to the LTH product briefing and showing it to us. Oh, it was um, really lovely to be here. Thank you so much for letting me show Lexada.